probably most you know, I'm Harry Gold, and um, I'm the CEO of Overdrive and uh, one of the founding partners. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you all for coming. This is the first time we've actually had a, a group gathering here, and it turned out I, uh, we had actually, I think all told with, with employees, I mean, we had about 160 people registered, so I was sort of counting on some people not showing up. <laughs> But I'm, I'm glad we have a, a, a full room here, and uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, Jane and, and, and how I met her. Um, so I went to um, an a and conference. The, the a and here is the Association of National Advertisers. Um, really amazing organization. Uh, they have a conference in Phoenix, and, and they have some workshops. And I went, and uh, Jane was one of the speakers. Um, and usually when I see these sort of traditional, yeah, we're a digital shop, right? These traditional advertisers, sorry. Uh, <laughs> you know, traditional I kind of look means at, old. Right. <laughs> so I look at this stuff and I kind of think, you know, that doesn't work today. But, you know, Jane went through um, what works in creative. Everything she said, I said, that applies so perfectly to uh, digital. And I said, that is, it was really timeless information that applied to really every marketing scenario. <coughs> then she started talking about her book, and I said, well, not only is she really brilliant and smart, and her stuff applies to everything we do today, she's actually really cool, <laughs> and obviously really experienced, and, and I was thinking, how could I get Jane up to Boston to speak to my employees? Because that's what this was really about. I just found her incredibly inspiring. Um, and she said, okay. And you, you promised you'd keep this short. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I said, all right. She said, I'm doing a book tour. So, you know, if, if, if you could post a book event, then you could do this. So it, it is my pleasure. Um, to introduce Jane Moss as somebody, let me just tell a little bit about <laughs> Jane. You know, as we've said, and, and I'll say, for you, you know, is sort of the personification of Peggy Olson. She worked under David Ogilvy, and you know, in the in the Mad Men days, and, and if I could say, bought your way up, and and you know, it's really an industry legend. All of you have seen um, the I Love New York campaign. Is that the longest running? So, you know, without further ado, uh, Jane Mass to teach us all about what was happening. I used to be a cheerleader at Richfield Park High School, and so you can do anything and I just keep going. <laughs> uh, we're going to do this in kind of three parts. I'm going to start off with a couple of little hors d'oeuvre about mad women, and, uh, and then I'm going to briefly uh, do the, the 15 or 20 minutes that Harry's talking about, because I know you're all in marketing and advertising, and I think you'll be interested in it. Um, I, I, I've boiled it down, and it's, uh, I think it's interesting. And, and then I'm going to come back and, and do a oh, few Okay? Sound, sound good? Um, uh, when people find out that I worked in advertising, during those sexy, sexist, mad women days, they consistently ask three questions. They say, were women really treated as second-class citizens? And did you guys really have three martini lunches? <laughs> then they lean forward and ask very confidentially, was there really that much sex in the one? I say the answer to all three questions is unequivocally yes. <laughs> on the show. Uh, uh, the media, I've been getting a blizzard of media attention, largely, largely because of Mad Men coming back for its fifth season in the week. And so, but consistently, the media are asking me just one question, and that is, was there really all that sex in the world? <laughs> and the, the media interviews and can focus right in on that. And I thought, God, I'm going to have the only X-rated book tour. <laughs> <laughs> I, have to, I have to tell you one cute little recent anecdote. Uh, 
Dean, uh, happened just last week or the week before, I was being interviewed by National Public Radio, NPR, a wonderful show, half hour show called uh, Focus 360, with a terrific interviewer who had read the book carefully, and he said, I've read the book, you know, word by word, I have so many questions to ask you, and of course, what he asked me is, was it really all that? <laughs> spend the whole hour talking about sex in the office, but it was really a very good interview. It was jazzy. It was, you know, it, it, it was funny, but I left feeling really good. This was the very first radio interview I had, and I sort of floated down the hall saying, good for you, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> you're really going. It's really good. And I passed the receptionist desk, and the, she's talking to a visitor, and they're so busy talking, they don't notice that I'm walking by. And the visitor is saying to the receptionist, who is being interviewed in there? And the receptionist says, I don't know, it's some old lady talking about sex. <laughs> <laughs> so, going to turn to the subject of advertising, which is a very sexy subject. Uh, what we're, we're going to talk for a little, just a little while about, um, about the creative process and how you look at creative work and decide, what creative work in rough form and decide whether it's going to be good, effective, win awards, all of that good stuff. Uh, how do you know? And how do you get good, compelling feedback? To creative people, and I don't care what I, I don't care what discipline you're in, whether you're in whether you're an account person or a media person, whether you're in social media, traditional old media, <laughs> uh, or, or whether you're a creative person that has to give comments to other creative people. Um, at some point, you know, all of us in this business are called on to make a, a statement about whether. It's whether rough creative work should be produced, whether it's going to be good. And so that's that's what we're going to talk about a little bit. By the way, please, this is a this is this is an interactive agency. This is an interactive uh, this is an interactive presentation. And uh, I'm going to ask you to do a little work as we go along. And if I say my experience is ABC and yours is XYZ, you know, please please speak up. Um, perhaps I'm going backwards. Uh, it's, it's, it, why is it so hard that this whole creative decision making is because there's so much riding on it. I mean, my God, if every, every little ad you do, and if it's a big new campaign for, for a client, then it's really, there's just, there's just so much, so much at stake. It's so personal. Um, I, I think as much as we try to make advertising into a science, it's still very much an art. Um, and I, I know, for instance, I know from personal experience that when you're looking at a print ad or a banner ad uh, or anything or anything that's print, a, a poster, unless you get the message, the key consumer benefit in the headline, you're not going to get it across. And so uh, when I look at a, at a print ad and the creative people say, you know, and it's right on strategy, Jane, and I say, I, I, where's, where's the key consumer benefit? And they say, it's right here, check paragraph two, you know? And I say, I don't, I don't think so. But that's personal. I know from my own experience it's not going to work, but a lot, of, a lot of people that I work with don't. It's also, it's also very subjective. I, I was working about a year ago with my client, Brown Foreman, a wonderful client. They make Jack Daniels. <laughs> I don't have any samples with me. <laughs> They make a bourbon called Woodford Reserve. If there are any bourbon drinkers here, I recommend Woodford Reserve. It is bourbon not to have in the um, Anyway, we, we took into focus groups. We took three fully fledged out campaigns, and the account people sitting at, behind the two way mirror liked campaign one, the creative people behind the two way mirror liked campaign two, and the, the, men, the men who were sitting in the room where the bourbon drinkers like campaign three. And uh, so it, you know, we have three different camps and it just confirmed me. It really is subjective. And you have that terrible feeling of 
you know, suppose I pick this one, oh God, what if I'm wrong? What if I pick the wrong one and that other one that I'm taking granted? Um, all right, I'm gonna put you to work. I want you to play the positioning game with me for just a minute, okay? Ready, ready to work? All right, I'm gonna give you the name of a brand, and I just want you to shout back to me the first thing that comes into your head, all right? Ready? Suppose I say to you, Volvo. Safety. Well, that's very good. <laughs> Brand have to do with the agency and the company to have you as one handle for safe safety. Consistency. Sorry. Consistency. Consistency. Absolutely. Absolutely. Authenticity. What do you mean? Authenticity. Yes, it's true. Absolutely. If, if, the, if, the, that, if those cars didn't live up to the safety play, that campaign would be dead mm -hmm. in, in a second. Uh, any, anything else? Clear messages. Clear messages. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely single-minded, bang, clear, simple messages. Getting the same thing across consistently about a car that truly is safe. Puts it all together. They dramatize the benefits. Oh, that's, yes. They consistently dramatize the benefits. Thank you. That No one else has, has mentioned that before, uh, and I've used this for a couple of years now. Oh, I, I still remember the occasion when Ed McCabe got in trouble for overdrive. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. They, 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 they reinforced the roof. Yeah. Yes. But uh, a demonstration, if you have the ability to do it in anything you're working on, a demonstration is the most powerful tool that we have in advertising. Uh, it, it, it's a wonderful television tool, but it can also work in print. Um, before and after weight loss remedies always do that. That's a demonstration. Uh, let me do one more with you. How about, um, I said, the American Express car. I got you on that one. I haven't used that in 25 years. Um, and, and in between, there have been a number of campaigns, like uh, membership has its privileges, which they ran for eight or nine years. We all said that, by the way. Yes. That's, that's right. They, uh, they let it slip. They let it slip in New York. Yes. In, in southern New England, we have a co-branded car with, uh, with American Express. So they, they are, well, all right. So, they so everybody you're asked. sort of reviving it. <laughs> <laughs> but but remember, remember what just happened here. Some of you said, some of you brought forth a, a, a very, very old tagline. <coughs> most memorable one they've ever had and why they left it, God only knows. But this is what happens when you jerk your brand around from the post and art and do not, you know, keep with a consistent strategy the way Volvo has. Uh, uh, what you want to do with a creative brief, some of us were talking about this earlier, a copywriter friend of mine calls them creative longs. And, uh, and you want to make that creative brief as and perfect so that so that the because the object of the creative brief is to make the creative team say, I get it, I get it, you don't have to say anything more. That's really why it's worth sweating over and, 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 and laboring over to make every word work and, and sing. The, the, my favorite creative brief of, of all time was one that was done in the London office of J. Walter Thompson. They were working <laughs> on an assignment for, for Quaker Oats, which wanted to take its very geriatric, dying, old opioid brand and make it conte into a contemporary, fresh, lively cereal. And the creative brief said, take the brand out of bedroom slippers and put it into nightmares. <laughs> and, and, and the creative people said, got it. Now that's, that, that's, not, that's not easy. You don't just sit down and write that. Not all creative briefs can be terrific creative briefs, but they, you know, they need to try. Beware of the insight pitfall. We are in a, we are in a decade of insights. And every research organization or every research department and every agency and every client I'm working with is now calling itself 
the insights department. And the problem is that now we're seeing in creative briefs, what is the insight that drives this? And what I'm saying is, uh, I think we should add in parentheses, if there is one. <laughs> because, because insights are very hard, and they're very hard to, to find a true insight, and they're very precious. And you need to be looking for them all the time. <coughs> it means, for me, the, one of the best ways you can find insights is just being with your target audience, being with your consumers. Uh, I say to my Jack Daniels friends, hang out, hang out, you know, hang out at bars. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but it's worth its weight in gold to know what your consumer is really thinking and how she or he is, is acting. Uh, so the insight pitfall is. Uh, that poor bastard who's writing the brief says, oh God, I don't have an insight. And so he delves into some Nielsen research somewhere and plops some bit of information in that is not a true insight. And, uh, uh, and, and then the creative team, if they're good, uh, will try to weave that non-insight into the, into, the, into the advertising. And it gets, you know, it just money for water. So be careful with that. Uh, I wanted to share three examples um, insights. So I was working at Southern Comfort, that's also a brand for me. And um, we, a couple of years ago, we made, well, by the way, any of you drink, ever drink Southern Comfort? Oh, a lot of sophisticated audience. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you know that you don't go to a bar and say, oh, I would like a, a Southern Comfort, please. What do you, what do you order? So well, we made a we made a commercial for the first time in the history of the brand where people were ordering SoCo, SoCo lime, SoCo, SoCo, SoCo. So uh, we, we said SoCo about a dozen times in the commercial, and lo and behold, almost immediately, the awareness just shot through the roof. It was it was it was we called the brand what its target audience calls it. It was amazing, and I, I that's what I told. Them. You know, it's because we had started out hanging at bars and I learned how to drink shooters. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Top Job is an example of paying attention to what's going on in focus groups. We did about 30 focus groups all across the country, north, south, east, west, and of course we were only women in the focus groups. It's, it's, it, it's, a, it's a kitchen floor cleaner. Uh, and the moderator in every one of the groups asked the question, uh, how do you know when it's time to clean the kitchen floor? And in every group we heard the same language. When I come down in the morning in my bare feet to make the coffee, when the floor scrunches under my feet, I know it's time to clean it. And so out of that came a campaign that I didn't write called Barefoot and Clean. And, uh, uh, and, and because that insight was so real and, and so genuine, it really, every, every woman so we had a gut reaction to it. It felt, it felt true and, and it worked. Uh, Regina is an example of a, a brand that also listened to women talking. I was working at Procter & Gamble's Crown, good old shampoo, um, and we, we were in focus groups and we heard women saying, well, after you use your favorite shampoo for six or eight months, it quits on you, ladies. You know this, right? See, every woman is nodding to an old man going there. So we didn't do anything with it for Prell, for which I could have shot myself years later. But Neutrogena, about five years later, did the same kind of focus because they heard the same thing. And they said, let's position, brilliant, brilliant, let's position our shampoo as the one to move to when your, shampoo, when your favorite shampoo puts on you. Is that brilliant to be the one that everybody has to move to, you know, for uh, every six months? So <coughs> look, look for insights all the time. Louis Pasteur said, chance falls upon the prepared mind. So if you're looking for a better shot at mind. Uh, I'm going to talk for just a minute about elements of effective communication. By and large, there are some things, we talked about a couple of them, like being single-minded. There are a few things that you can do that will simply make your, simply make your, uh, your communication, I'm not, I'm not using the word advertising, that will make your communications better no matter what the medium is. 
whether it's interactive or traditional or sky riding. Uh, and uh, what you want effective advertising is what I was the president of the New York agency for Earl Common Brown, and our mantra was that we build your sales overnight and build your brand over time. And I think good advertising does both simultaneously. It builds your sales and builds your brand. And you, you, you want to compel your consumer both emotionally and rationally. So you, 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 get, you get them in the head it, rationally and also in the heart or in the gut. Um, you, you want to link the brand to the link the advertising and the, and the brand <coughs> in such a way that people can't play back that commercial or that ad without, without playing back the name of the brand. There's nothing worse. You know, then the water cooler conversation the next day and say, did you see that funny commercial with the, with the chimpanzee and the, you know, it was for a, was it for a toothpaste or was it a car? You know, I mean, that's really a terrible waste of money. Um, okay, delivers the key consumer benefit clearly. I have a lot of clients who will struggle looking at a man, turn it around, scratch their heads and say, is the key consumer benefit coming through here? If you have to ask that question, it's not coming through, okay? What you want is the consumer benefit has to leap out of, of that communication, leap out of the ad, leap out of the banner ad, leap out of a tweet, it, and it has to leap out of the So next time you look at the ad, you know, and you have to ask yourself, is are we communicating? Remember me standing here talking about this, all right? <laughs> um, attention yet, David Ogilvy, my dear old boy, you can't save souls in an empty church. He, he taught us all that we needed intrusive, intrusive in the sense of the word, advertising, um, uh, to get people's attention and then you can persuade them to buy. But if you don't get their attention in the first place, they don't know you're there. Single-minded. This is the thing probably I, I'm most bearish uh, about because I know it's hard enough these days to get one idea across in communication. People are so stressed, they're so busy, they have the attention to span of sleep. And, and if getting two ideas across is very hard and free and simply impossible. Nothing makes my heart sink more than, than seeing a, a, a creative brief that says, you can see the benefit one, two, three. <laughs> Uh, also, by the way, I, I think that we should try to limit ourselves in reasons why. My heart also sinks when I see uh, under you know, reasons to believe the benefit, uh, the reasons why may be drawn from the following, and then you get a laundry list of eight or ten things, and very often the client is still leaving it up to create a team to decide whether the benefit is this or that or the other. Very dangerous. I, I think we should try harder to discipline ourselves so that we have not only one benefit, but one reason to believe that benefit. I'm sure you <coughs> try harder, you'll find that there is one, one reason to believe that floats more to the top, it's more persuasive and more important. Um, that person, I have a question? Okay, stop me again, question. Um, simple, that's not the same thing as single-minded. Simple is don't ask consumers to work, they won't. Uh, creative people tell me all the time, well, this headline is so clever. It will really make people think, and it will lead them right into the body. And I'm sorry, I say bullshit. Relevant, the, the matter and the manner of the advertising should, should mesh. Uh, I, I've seen some research that says that your, your customer, your consumer, feels vaguely cheated if it looks like an ad for a car and it, tends to, and it turns out that it's for peanut butter. Uh, and, and it works the same way if it's an ad for peanut, if it looks like it's for peanut butter and it ends up being a car. And super say, I've given you my time, I've given you my attention, and you do it to me and make me feel stupid. And they don't like that. And that it's almost deceptive advertising as far as they <coughs> Memorable is your communication going to have stickiness. Are they, is, are they going to remember it tomorrow, next week, next month? That's particularly true if you're talking about products that people don't use every day, like chewing gum. 
uh, so is, is, is your communication going to make them remember your brand when they need it on the map? Uh, unique or preemptive? Uh, it's very hard to do anything that's unique because if it works, your competition will come and copy it. Uh, and that's true whether it's a product or a, a, a kind of communication. And however, you can preempt the truth. In New York, up and down Central Park South, there are about 12 hotels, all you know, facing Central Park. One beautiful old hotel that's no longer there for 50 years had the slogan, Central Park is our front yard. Right? They plastered it everywhere, you see in our advertising, had it you know, in the rooms on the 10 cards, they're everywhere. Um, and any other hotel up and down that strip would say, Central Park is our front yard too. Uh, but they, that, they would have looked pretty stupid because if that was the same racist tagline, Central Park is our front yard. They said it first, they said it memorably, they kept on saying it and they owned it. And that, I believe, is exactly what Master Park has done with Priceless, with the whole positioning of it isn't the thing you buy, it's the experience, it isn't the, the peanuts and the, and the, the tickets to the stadium. That you got with the master card. It's, the, it's the experience of sitting next to your 11 year old kid at the game. Uh, and boy, American Express and Visa discover all the issues they had. Because any credit card could, could, could have taken this position. Uh, but MasterCard took it, they said it wanted to be priceless, and, uh, and now they own it. So think about, think about your ability to be preemptive. Uh, engaging. Good advertising should either give you some kind of an emotional lift, or it should entertain you, or it should educate you. Uh, no, it's no ad to do all three. Be careful about entertainment. I, I watched the Super Bowl. Uh, the Wall Street Journal called me a few days before Super Bowl and said, uh, Mrs. Moss, we'd like you to watch the Super Bowl and, and be with us for a live blog reporting on the action as it goes on. And I said, I think you have the wrong number here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've never watched the football game. <laughs> and they said, no, no, they wanted me to, they wanted me to look at the ads. And it was a little schizophrenic because my computer, my television set is here and my computer is here. So they wanted me to, you know, to, to email them comments as, as the as the commercials. So I I watch her and I type <laughs> here the commercial is going on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I miss some completely. But in in a nutshell, I, I thought that the commercials as a whole were trying awfully hard to be funny. And they therefore weren't as funny as they've been in the past years. I think they were trying awfully hard to be entertaining and fresh. You know, and they were kind of more than I guess, I guess the one I like is the one for Dan and Yogurt, where Stamos is teasing the woman, you know, <laughs> giving, pretending to give her a little yogurt and then taking the spoon away, pretending to tease her, tease her, and she kind of headbutts and knocks him over. And I said, take that, Don Draper. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, finally, you want, you want it to be campaignable. And you want a big idea, a big idea. You want it to work both horizontally and vertically. Um, uh, you want it to work horizontally is in many, many meetings. I think a big idea has, has legs that, that can do that. I heard a radio commercial in New York a couple of weeks ago for a paint company. Paint, I mean, it was it, it brought to life all the colors that the paints were uh, without that benefit of visual. So a big idea to do that. And you want it to have a long life vertically, like like uh, like priceless, which is now going into its 13th year. And that agency keeps refreshing and refreshing it. It's just wonderful. Um, and 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 the kind of longevity that that the Bongo has that we just um, and I'm now not going to show you the real commercials because I think uh, how are we on time? Well, I think we... Um, I, I think I should talk about Maverick. You want to talk about Maverick? <coughs> what? what? You want 
How's your stamina? I mean, well, I think we, we had till 7.30. We said 5.30 to 7.30, so it's... it's yeah. Can we, can we, um, would you like to see a real commercial? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I actually put an email that would show the real. <laughs> um, I just, I didn't want to wear out my book. This is, well, oh, this is, these are gold nuggets. I mean, I gotta say, I mean, I I said these are monsters. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is a I could switching to Geico really save you 15% or more on car insurance? Was Abe Lincoln honest? Now, I'm going to give you an assignment, okay? I want everyone here to, as you watch, there are about 10 of the bloody commercials, okay? All 30 seconds. Maybe there's a couple of minutes. I want you individually to, to pick out the the commercial that you think best illustrates getting across the key consumer benefit. Not what is the best key consumer benefit, but which of these spots. You know, that means you're going to have to figure out what you think is the key consumer benefit. Which of these spots is doing the best job of getting it across, okay? And then the next thing I'd like you to pick out is which of these spots uh, is 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 most single-minded all right and even though you think maybe there's one commercial that represents both still pick a different one for the second just to make it pull it in all right <laughs> <laughs> could switching to geico really save you 15 percent or more on your insurance <laughs> was abe lincoln honest does this just make my bad friend look big <laughs> Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Hey, Mom! What are you doing? What is that? What is this? It's a special paste I invented to replace socks. Put it in our feet in it. Why? Because we can't find socks that shape to our feet. We're sick of it. Sick of it. That's really stupid. <laughs> That's the future. Haynes makes better fitting socks the whole family will love. Guaranteed or your money back. Buckle up, everybody, because we're taking a ride. They can strain your relationships and hurt your pride. It's the credit roller coaster, and as you can see, it kind of bites. So sing the lyrics with me. When your tech goes up, your score goes down. When you pay a little off, it goes the other way around. It's just the same for everybody, every boy and girl. The credit roller coaster makes you want to hurl. So throw your hands in the air and wave them around like a wannabe frat boy trying to get down. Bring them right back to where your laptop's at. Log on to freecreditreport.com. Snap. Free credit score for the moment and triple advantage. Licorice. <laughs> and what happens if they don't complete an assignment? 
of having people talk about the Gecko Insurance Company. I really, you know, it really gets it. And so the art director was scribbling on a napkin, and he said, well, why don't we have, have a Gecko as spokesman, and they keep calling him Geico, and, you know? And the quiet thought it was wonderful. They all had another drink. <laughs> and the copywriter brought this idea in to the creative director the next day and he said, I think this is the worst idea I have ever heard of in, in the history of this agency. It is just a gecko uh, as a spokesman for the insurance company. And so they said, well, they were with the client and they had kind of, sort of, kind of resold it. <laughs> I know, the knowing laughter out there, you've been there, done that, right? And uh, uh, so he said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll test it. We'll test it, and when it dies, it said it's the doorknob. Well, they, they tested it, and of course, it did wonderfully. Uh, the, the gecko, the gecko, gecko, because, you know, made advertising. Yeah. So that's, that, that's one of those things. So, like, the creative director has it on his wall. Yeah. So, be careful about what you turn down. Um, I'm just turning to you oh, okay. Uh, uh, I think there are really just two questions you ask yourself when you're evaluating creative. Does it reflect the brief? Will the target audience recognize itself? Is there a real insight? We talked about that. Does the benefit, uh, is the reason to believe clear? Is there, as we talked about, one reason to believe, maybe two? Um, is the tone and manner appropriate? You know, if you're selling a product I worked on at Oakley, Pepperidge Farm, which is old-fashioned goodness, you, you, you really have to be careful about having a rock track. You have to be careful about <coughs> New York edginess for an old-fashioned Johnson, uh, Johnson, uh, I think the company's now called Johnson, it's not Johnson Wax anymore, but you know companies that say, we're a family company, you don't want to let your creative people get in there with edgy stuff. Um, and is this going to, will this particular communication, whether it's a Facebook or a banner or a 30 second commercial or a spread, a center spread, is it going to get, is it going to accomplish or begin to help accomplish uh, the objective expressed in the brief? And is the benefit, then you ask, is it effective? And I always ask that twice. Is it effective? Is it as effective as it can possibly be? And uh, can, 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 you, can you preempt a big idea? Uh, is it campaignable, both horizontally and vertically? Uh, is it important? Is, I have a lot of clients who are so stuck on, is it different? Are we going to have a, get an idea, of course, that's different from the competition? And they're, they're so focused on different that they forget that, that it, it's more important to be important to the consumer. You can make, everybody in the world makes black widgets, and you can say, I've got to eliminate pink widgets. But if nobody wants pink widgets, they're different, <laughs> but you're not going to sell any. So remember that you need to be important first and foremost. Is it single-minded? Is it getting across one rifle shot of an idea? And is it memorable? Um, and I think you, you, you start off by making sure that your client and your creative team and everybody are around one table with their heads together and that everybody understands every single word in that group. And don't take for granted that everybody does. Uh, you really need to talk about it and, 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 and to discuss it make sure because there's nothing worse than having the client go away and the agency go away and they all get back together again in three weeks and they they haven't they have two different ideas about what people are saying. We've all been there done that. And uh, it's a terrible waste of time, money and relationships because it's the kind of thing that more than anything else makes relationships Okay. Uh, any any questions about this? Um, uh, now, Matt, um, uh, this is a, well, I, I, I told you what everybody is zeroing in on, 
and since you're obviously such a feisty audience, hard drinking, uh, <laughs> uh, I thought I'd, I'd talk for a little bit about the chapters. By the way, the chapters in my book uh, kind, of, kind of tell you, you know, what's going on in the book. Chapter two is called Sex in the Office. I wanted to call chapter three more sex in the office. <laughs> and so chapter three is, is called uh, get the money before they screw you. <laughs> um, actually, that is a quote um, from Shirley Polakoff, the legendary advertising woman who wrote one of the great lines of all time, does she or doesn't she? Hair color so natural, only her hairdresser goes for sure. Uh, Shirley was manning a booth with some benefit uh, in the 1980s, and she called it over to her, and she said, Jane, I think you're on your way to being a big success, and I have some advice for you. And I said, Shirley, I'm all ears tell me. She said, get the money before they screw you the way they screw me. <laughs> <laughs> she, had, she had made millions for Flipcom um, and billions for Clara. Uh, when Shirley started, only hussies died her hair. I don't think nobody died her hair. And, and by the time her campaigns were over with, if I have but one life, let me do it as a blonde, blah, blah. Um, 51% of women in this country back in the 70s were poor coloring their hair. Shirley never used the word da, but, uh, but she felt that flipped. Would come and Farrell had just never, never uh, reimbursed her, only rewarded her. We got reimbursed, rewarded her. So that was her advice to me. Mm. Uh, chapter, chapter five is called The Three Martini Lunch and Other Vices. And I saw so it tonight. We talked, I'd start off with, with a little bit about sex in the office mm -hmm. um, and then give you just a twinkle, a sprinkle of three, the three martini lunch and other vices. Uh, and then we, maybe we'll have a few minutes for, for any questions from you about anything that I can try to answer. There are some things I won't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when I interviewed a lot of women for this book, and I interviewed some men too, but more women than men, and every single person I interviewed, I would ask about three martini lunch and sex in the office. One of the first interviews I had was with one of the grand dames of, of, of advertising. Her name is Joan Lipton. She was one of the first women to have her name on an agency. It was called Martin Lipton. And she is a tiny, she's taller than me, but she's, she's, not, she's not much. <laughs> she's a tiny kind of steely queen mother type. And so I felt sort of difficult with that. I asked her about sex in the office, but I, I had to. And I uh, said, so, Joan, she's at Young Lubicon, which is supposed to be the prototype of Sterling Cooper Agency. And Young and Lubicon in the 60s was the hotbed of sex among agencies. So I decided that she'd been there in, in the 60s, and so I had to ask her. And so I said, so Joan, was there, was there much sex in the office when you were there? And she said, well, Jane, everyone was partaking. <laughs> But you must realize that at the time I was married, I had a three-year-old son, and was living in Connecticut. And I said, oh, Joe, I just, I do realize that, but uh, were, you, were you aware of much sex in the office? And she said, aware? Hell, I partook. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, well, I guess you won't let me use that in the book, will you? And she said, I'm 87 years old, what do I have to do? <laughs> Chapter two. Another, another quite famous person, Linda Bird Frankie, who worked as a copywriter, uh, uh, left the world of advertising and has become quite a, an award winning, noted biographer. She wrote a wonderful biography of Barbara Walters. Uh, well, I asked Linda the same question Was there much sex in the office? She was also a very Rubicon. And Linda said, Well, I lost my virginity to be a executive on Lime Jello. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I said no. Linda, I guess you won't let me use that in the book, will you? And she said, I've been married three times. I have nothing to do with it. There was a client of mine who has to be nameless because he's still a client of mine. He's quite a distinguished CMO. And so he gave me this story. Uh, and he said, don't even use my first name. Uh -huh. 
Um, so I'm using his first name because it, it makes it easier for me to tell the anecdote, but uh, I, I, I will deny it. You know. <laughs> All right, so you're, you're in on this. So Don is 24 years old. He's fresh out of you know, graduate school. He's newly married. He's new in New York. He's a, as an assistant account executive, and is he green? I mean, he's really you know, he's what you have here. And he's working for a packaged goods uh, brand, and the client from the Midwest calls and says, I'm coming into New York for the meeting, and I'd like to be, and I'll be there for a night, and I'd like you to arrange a date for me. And Don says, well, I'm, I'm fairly newly married, but I have a real, a, quite a few really lovely girlfriends, former girlfriends. And the client says, not a date, a date. And Don says, oh, I hear the italics in his voice, and I get the idea. And Don doesn't know what to do. This is just beyond him. So he goes into one of the senior partners who says, this sort of thing may happen in other agencies, but it does not go on here at Irwin, Wacy, Ruth, Roth, and Ryan, right? Um, and so Don says, I'm going to do it. And figures he's going to go to the creatives. They'll know what to do. So he goes to an art director, and the art director says, it's easy. Just go down to the newsstand in the lobby, buy a copy of Screw Magazine, all the hookers advertise it. <laughs> so Don goes down to the lobby, and there's a woman at the newsstand, and it takes Don three passes to get up nerd enough to ask for Screw Magazine. He buys a pack of chewing gum, then he buys a pack of cigarettes, and he doesn't even smoke. And finally, he buys Screw Magazine, he gets it up to his office, and lo and behold, all the hookers, lots of, lots of ads, and being a good account executive, and wanting to do the best for his client, <laughs> reads them very carefully. <laughs> and he circles a few that he thinks have promised, and he calls half a dozen of these young ladies <laughs> and makes notes, uh, promising, uh, a little rough, uh, you know, notes like that. And then he chooses one, and he goes to visit her, because he oh, is a good account executive. You no, know, he wants to make sure what he's getting for his client, and he, puts down the money, however much it is, they make the, the date, and uh, the client comes into town, the next day he calls Don and says, they had a very nice date, thank you very much, he returns to the Midwest, Don brings a big sigh of relief, you know, case closed. Uh, about a week later, he comes home, puts his briefcase on the bed, and he says to his wife, oh, by the way, the paycheck's in the briefcase, just go, you know, up and up yourself. <laughs> You know, he hears a shriek <laughs> and his wife emerges holding the copy of Screw Magazine with all the circles. <laughs> and she says to him, you bastard. <laughs> and he says, I did it for my client. <laughs> she says, you're not only a bastard, you're a pimp. <laughs> He doesn't know whether she actually believed his story ultimately or whether she simply forgave him. <laughs> so, do you believe this? Story? <laughs> yes, yes, yes I, I, I do. I really do. Uh, I think he's that kind of sweet man. And, uh, and I met his wife, too. Uh, uh, the three martini lunch. Uh, Jerry Delafamina says the only reason that, that we all got away with it. Uh, in the 60s is because our clients were drinking just as much as we were, so nobody knew, you know? <laughs> um, I uh, interviewed one woman who, was, who told me that when she worked uh, as in the typing pool, she worked for a creative director who took her to lunch a couple of times a week, and she said, we always started with martinis. Uh, he would have three and I would have two uh, at the, before lunch, and then after lunch we would always end with rusty nails. Are. And I'm sure some of you do anyway. It's a combination of, of, of uh, scotch and dram gooey. So lethal, obviously lethal. Coming. I said, Linda, how did you go back to work after, after that? And she said, I think what saved us is we didn't have lunch. I think what saved us is we didn't have wine with lunch. <laughs>